get to begin a whole new series today, and for the next few months, we're going to be looking in, as we always do, looking at God's Word, but we're going to spend some time specifically looking at one book of the Bible uh, and seeing what God has to say to the church, to, to us, because we want to know God better, and we want to be changed by Him, right? I mean, our aim when we uh, gather together uh, on a Sunday morning is, our aim is to, to know what is true, uh, and we want to love God and love others, and I want to experience change in all the little bits of our lives. I want God to work, and God to move, and God to guide, and God cares about about all the different things going on. He cares about your world. God cares about you. He cares about your desires and your ambitions, and he cares about your thoughts. He cares about what you do. God cares about all of that. God is, um, God's, God will speak to us through his word. But there's a whole lot of different voices that go on all around us, right? And so how do we make decisions? How do we... Uh, how, how do we know what God has to say to us and be led by that and discern what is true? How do we discern the decisions that we're to make for life? Well, as Christians, we turn to God's word. We turn to the, to the Bible as, as God's word. We believe that this book is the very words of God. We believe that this word is, is true. We believe that this word, the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible are complete. It's what God has for us. The other thing interesting regarding God's word is that we believe as Christians that God's word is totally sufficient for our needs. It's totally sufficient for what we need to be able to, to know God and to grow in him and to, for instructions for life. So we're going to spend time here, and I, I, I take it that it's your, your precious time. We're going to spend time here seeing what God has to say to us so we can follow him. Well, tucked away in the very, near the very back of your Bible is a letter that was written to the church. It's titled 1 John. That's what we're going to be studying over the next few months. In fact, I would encourage you to turn to 1 John. If you're using the Bible on the chair, it's page 1082. Page 1082, otherwise, open up to 1 John. It's, if, you, if you hit Revelation, you went too far. Go back a little bit, and you're going to come across 1 John. It's only five chapters long. It's 1,111 words in total length. It only takes about 15 minutes or so to read through. It doesn't take long to read through, and but it's packed with all kinds of great truth. And whenever I approach God's Word and I'm starting to study a, a new book of the Bible, one of the things that, that I do is I ask a number of questions. I ask questions like, uh, well, who wrote it? And, and who was the author writing to? I ask questions like, well, what's happening at the time of this writing? What's happening? Why are they writing? What is it they're communicating to the church? What's their purpose? What's the themes of the Bible? Now, if you have a, you, you have a Bible, and by the way, if you don't have a Bible, there's a bunch of Bibles in the back there. Uh, there's a, a rack there of Bibles. You can take one of those. They're totally free. Um, but if you have God's Word, maybe you also have what's called a study Bible. And in this study Bible, oftentimes there's like, down in the bottom section, there's a bunch of little notes that are kind of descriptors of maybe some of the verses. Uh, there's also maps, there's illustrations, there's charts, different things to help us better understand what God has said in his word. Uh, also, in a study Bible is going to be an introduction. And in that introduction is where they're going to answer a lot of those same questions. Who wrote it, and why, and when, and all kinds of different things. And so, to the point, for instance, in 1 John, 1 John was written by John. 
is the apostle John, one of the 12 disciples. And John, when he wrote, he writes the church somewhere around 85 to 95 AD. He's likely the last surviving uh, apostle at the time of this writing. And John is writing, and uh, last surviving member of the 12, he's one of the only disciples that didn't die a martyr's death. Reports are that he was actually boiled in oil, but he survived that, and that was prior to him uh, being cast out into a, uh, an island called Patmos, where he ends up writing the book of Revelation. This John is the same John, the author, that wrote five books of the Bible in the New Testament. So the Gospel of John, so you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospel of John was written by this same author. So he wrote John, which is all about Jesus and about where he came from and his life and death and resurrection. If you want to know about Jesus, the book of John is a wonderful place to start. John wrote that. John also wrote 1 John, 2 and 3 John. And if you were to read those, in fact, you'll come across 2 and 3 John, and they're only one chapter long, super quick. And, and those are all written to the present, to the church, about how to live now in, in, in your faith, how to live. And then, fifthly, John wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, which is all about how, uh, spoiler alert, how God wins and Jesus' return. So John writes five books of the Bible, and here we are. We're going to study 1 John. It's a great book, and what was what really intrigued me was why John wrote to the church. John is writing in 1 John, and he writes to, uh, well, John, he was living in Ephesus or in the area of Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, and he writes to the churches of Asia Minor, which was, again, in modern-day Turkey. What intrigues me with why I, I, I want to spend time here in this book is because of what John is addressing to the church. I believe that it has great application for the church today. What they were dealing with. Well, for them, at the time of this writing, again, between 85 and 95 AD, one of the last books to be written. Uh, this is, he's, he's writing to the church that is generally composed of the second and third generation of Christians. Second and third generation. They've been around for a little bit. And some of the Christians at the time of writing are now in a time of persecution. Also, there's others that perhaps, now that they've been following, they've turned to God and they've trusted in Christ, and that gets really exciting when you first turn. But over time, maybe the thrill kind of wanes and goes down. The, the, the passion and the zeal that, that a new believer often has began to flicker. And then they had a, a diminishing faith. So John writes to that. Also what's going on when John writes is that there are false teachers that have infiltrated into some of the churches. And, and, and that infiltration, that, that coming in, some of the Christians were, were becoming lazy in their, uh, in their Christian standards. They weren't grasping and getting their minds around what God has said and about the truth. There's this growing cancer of false doctrine that's going on behind the scenes in the writing of this. And the church was needing to be grounded in the truth. They were weak on doctrine. That's the setting that John writes his letter to the church. What we'll see as we study 1 John over the coming weeks is that John has a, uh, a heart, a soft heart for the church. He has a deep love for God and for God's people. In fact, he's known as the apostle of love. He's, uh, he, he loves 
God's truth, he loves God's people, and he loves living out the faith. I think that's, that's what we need today in the, in the church. What not you say? A growth and a love of, of God and the truth and a love for people. This is a letter that's written to the church. And in one degree or another, we're dealing with all these same kind of issues. Let, let me explain in more detail. Uh, I'll, I'll give it in, in three uh, pieces here of what was happening then at the time of writing in comparison to today, both happening then and now, then and today. So for instance, back then and today, believers are struggling in their faith. Believers are struggling in their faith. Uh, now, I, I love it when, when the writer tells us specifically of why he writes. Well, John does that in a couple places, but let me draw your attention to just 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Turn a couple pages over, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He's addressing believers who are struggling in their faith. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, look what he says. He says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's writing to who? He's writing to believers, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. He's writing to believers. Why? For what purpose? We see it here with the words, so that. So I've written these things to you, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know. This word, uh, oidos, is the Greek word, but it, that doesn't mean much to you. What it means is instinctively, that you will instinctively know that you have eternal life. John wants us to know as believers in Jesus Christ that you have eternal life with God, that you, are, that you know him. Sin is one of the issues that John addresses numerous times here because sin is keeping Christians down. So how do you deal with the sin? John addresses that. Christians are struggling with doubt in their faith. John addresses that. In fact, he's going to answer the question of, well, how do I know if I'm a Christian or not? How do I know I'm a Christian? Well, John in 1 John will give the marks of what it looks like to be a follower, uh, to be full-on Christian, to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. John lays out the marks of what it looks like to, to follow Christ, to be a Christian. He answers that. Believers were struggling in their faith. As John addresses this. Then and now, then and today. Also, then and today, false doctrine was spreading. False doctrine is spreading at the time of this writing. The time of this writing, there's early forms of Gnosticism uh, that's on the rise. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, uh, where we get Gnosticism of of knowing, because in Gnosticism, you would need some kind of a, a special knowledge, special knowledge of, of knowing, and according to the view of Gnosticism, which we, we have tendencies to, that scholars believe, or John's addressing this issue, we'll hit that a little bit more next week, uh, but to give you an idea of Gnosticism and see if it has any kind of correlation with today, it has this idea and this view that redemption uh, or being right with, with God, to have redemption is through the divine light that is already within you. Uh, it's in the human soul. Just look within. It has the idea of I can look within for the truth as opposed to needing to repent and uh, of sin and have faith in Christ's death and resurrection. Look within. You don't really need to know Jesus and know the truth. Does that sound at all vaguely familiar at all today? That's 
everywhere. Today, there is this rise of believe whatever you want. Just look within. Uh, you can have, you can follow whatever you want. Any kind of moral or amoral route is okay. Just go for it. Believe. It's fine. You can do what you want. By the way, if you're reading through Genesis with us, <laughs> that addresses that a whole lot. Man's attempt to do what we want to do as opposed to what God has said. It starts way back in Genesis chapter 3 and runs all the way through, through Revelation. In fact, all the way through Revelation, if you just finished our reading last year, man, I mean, God, there are people that when they're under the, the judgment of God are just stiff-arming God and just all the more angry at God. They don't repent. Doing what is right is in our own eyes. That's on the rise. In fact, on the rise today, we see, uh, thanks to media and all the different means, we hear, I think, a whole lot more about uh, something that, in fact, a, a phrase that it, or a word that is new to me was called deconversions. So uh, a number of so-called Christians who have now deconverted, they have, at one time, they've, uh, they were so-called Christians following God's word, involved and engaged in all those different things, and now they have deconverted. They have uh, had epiphanies or revelations and come to the realization that they've been wrong the whole time, and anything that God has said or uh, anything that's been organized is, isn't wrong, and by looking within and by all their deep study, they've come to the realization that it's all wrong. Deconversions on the rise. It's happening here. Uh, then and today, I was honestly just stunned at a recent study done by Lifeway on... Uh, that was done with evangelical Christians. And when I say evangelical, I mean that not in a political sense, but in a sense of these are people who claim to be full-on Christians, full-on followers of God. They have trusted in Christ. They're evangelical Christians. And the belief system of doctrine or understanding truth, here's a couple of Statistics regarding this survey done on evangelical Christians. 52% of evangelical Christians believe God accepts the worship of all religions. 41% said that worshiping alone with one's family is a way to replace church. 32% of evangelical Christians said religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It's not objective truth. 32% of evangelical Christians said that it's just a matter of just personal opinion. 21% of evangelical Christians said that the Holy Spirit can tell them to do something that is absolutely forbidden in the Bible. 21%. That is, that is disturbing to me. As an evangelical Christian, we, we, we've got to be grounded in the word and grounded in the truth. It's not wishy-washy. God made his word very clear for us. And John, the author of 1 John, he wants us to know the truth. He wants us to know the truth and to defend the truth. So he'll answer those. In fact, he has repeated themes that keep coming back and, and themes and comparisons. Comparisons of Christ versus the Antichrist. Right versus wrong. Uh, light versus darkness, or the love of God versus the love for the world. He addresses this over and over again throughout these five chapters. Then and today, 
a whole lot of false doctrine was spreading. Thirdly, that we see in the book of 1 John, then, as well as today, is Christians were Christianish kind of Christians. There's a whole lot of confusion going on at the writing of this, and Christians were losing their passion. They're losing their first love. John addresses that in Revelation. Christians were Christianish. Well, again, we know what John's desire is, from what he says, he wants the believer's life to be full of joy. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John wants us to align our lives with, with God's desires and God's plans, not just going through the motions not just checking a box. That's Christianish. That's in Christian that's a Christian in name only. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but there's nothing that looks any different than the rest of the world. It's Christianish. But John wants us to make a difference because of a life lived for Christ. A life that's full of joy, filled with joy. John is addressing that. John shows us how to live our lives out uh, in, in the context of local church. What does it mean to live differently from the world? H- how do I love Jesus and more than the world? He addresses those. When a real Christian is growing and walking in Christ, they, they will obey his commands they, they, they want to. They desire to please God. They will, and a word that comes up numerous times, I think it's 22 different times, remain in him. They will remain in Christ. All here in these five chapters, as I said earlier, John has a, a love for God and a love for the church. God he loves, his, he loves God's people. And, and he wants us to, to know the truth and to live it out in love. It's his aim. As I said earlier, John is known as the apostle of love. So we see that theme of love over and over and over again. Numerous times we read, little children, my little children, or dear friends, In fact, six times he says that both of those phrases. Little children, dear friends. He has his love and he wants to put his arms. It's like we're reading. He wants to put his arms around the church and say, oh, I love you so much. I want you to walk in Christ. I want you to know him. I want you to experience the joy that is complete in him. It's said that... uh, that in the time of this, like I mentioned before, he's uh, one of the last surviving apostles, disciples of Jesus. He's, he's at, at such an age when he was uh, near the end in Ephesus, he would be carried in on a stretcher, unable to be able to walk, and they would carry him in in front of the church, and then uh, he would... He would get and he would work his way to, to be able to lean up on one arm and, and he would say, little children, guard yourself from idols and then lay back down. He, he, he loved the church. He loved God. He, he loved God's people. He, was, he, he loved deeply. He loved others. One last helpful piece as I was coming upon upon 1 John and and studying the author here, studying John. Known as the Apostle of Love, but he didn't begin with that title. 
Jesus didn't approach him. He's like, hey, John, you're going to be the apostle of love, man. In fact, what we know about John early on, if you do any kind of studying of John, if you go back to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you go back and you study about John, you find out he doesn't have much about the love at all in him. Jesus, in Mark chapter 3, calls John and his brother James, anybody know? The sons of thunder. That is not a compliment. Uh, in fact, it's a really vivid picture about the character traits of, of John and his brother James. John doesn't wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm just going to be full of love today. And it's just a sunny morning. I'm going to love others forevermore. And then he called him the, the apostle of love. Didn't work that way. He didn't just arrive there. Love was something that John had to grow in as he learned from Jesus as he followed Jesus, as he obeyed Jesus. He grew in his love. And frankly, I just find great comfort in that truth. You see, John was, if you do a study of John, you find out his character traits, the sons of thunder, he's, he's zealous, thunderous, He's passionate. He's fervent. We, we see uh, a couple of instances about John and his lack of love. Anything but love, in fact. So Jesus is, and the 12 disciples are moving along, and they are uh, going, and they, they pass through the city of Samaria, the, the region of Samaria. And it's uh, those are a people group that, that many of the Jews, they, they hated. They couldn't stand it because they didn't worship the right God. They didn't worship the right way. They, there's all kinds of issues. In fact, John and James were so indignant against the Samaritans that they want to call down fire from heaven to, to wipe them out. Hey, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? We're ready to do that. <laughs> There's no love at all in that. Just a whole lot of zealousness and passion without love, and that's dangerous. It's sinful. We also know John as um, right in the thick and the thin of all the debates about Who's the greatest disciple? John, he was one of the three. Do we have the 12? And then Jesus had three other disciples who were kind of on the inner circle. They, they experienced the, the Mount of Transfiguration. They experienced numerous things that the other disciples didn't. He was on the inside. So when there was debates among, and there was many of them, debates among the disciples about who's the greatest of the disciples... John is right in the center. He's like, this guy, me. There's no love in that. There's no humility. Just a lot of passion and zeal. The reason why I'm encouraged by that is because it, it reminds me of, of me, this guy. Early on in the, in the Marines, I remember uh, passion and Wanted to go feed the homeless. This guy that I saw, he was homeless down on Oceanside. I'm like, and I need to get a meal for him, and I'm going to share the gospel with him. So I go in, buy a meal, bring it out to him. I'm like, hey, man, I wanted to give you a meal. And he's like, oh, thanks so much. And he starts to walk away. And I said, hey, just hey, real quick, I, I wanted to be able to share with you. He's like, I, I, I can't right now. I need to go. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I just bought a meal for you. Uh, so you're going to sit down, and I have something I wanted to tell you. Uh, so I ordered the homeless guy to sit down so I can lovingly tell him the gospel. <laughs> Not loving. It was awful. It was terrible. A whole lot of zeal, a whole lot of passion, a whole lot of truth without any kind of love. 
when I'm looking at John and I'm studying John, if you have a picture uh, in your mind's eye that is maybe taken from the medieval art of, uh, of yesterday, of like you have pictures of, of like you'd see John, you'd see this nice little meek and mild, pale-skinned, effeminate uh, young man lying around on Jesus' shoulder and just with dove eyes just looking at him and like, ah, if you have that picture, forget it. That is not John. John is, is rugged. He's hard-edged. He's, uh, he, he fit right in with the, the fishermen disciples. Completely different than what was pictured. John is, let me give you some character traits early on of John. He's volatile, brash, aggressive, passionate, zealous, personally ambitious, explosive, and at times intolerant. Isn't that great traits? No. <laughs> That's John early on. In my study the last couple of weeks here of First John and, and John the Apostle, the author, I have personally been deeply moved and convicted by my study of John. As I've been studying through uh, the life of John, God, God began to convict me of my own sin my own lack of love, my own sin of pride, my own sin of not trusting God in all the areas of life, my own sin of that lack of love for others. I'm, I'm big on, on truth. Big on truth. And far, far too often, I lack love. Love the truth and lack love. So 1 John, for me, already has been a mirror that God has used to point at my own life, my own heart, and their own recesses of my heart that, that has needed to seek some forgiveness from him. It's been already deeply personal. The study has also been a real encouragement to my heart. Because as I look at the young John and then I looked at the aged John I see maturity I see, a, I see growth John is an example of what it looks like to, to grow in Christ to, to, to love him and to obey him I see in John what I want in my own life. I, I want a commitment to the truth that's balanced in love. John MacArthur, I think, hit it right on the head when he said this. Truth without love has no decency it's just brutality. On the other hand, love without truth has no character. It's just hypocrisy. Truth without love has no decency. It's just brutality. 
that's the direction that I lean. On the other hand, love without truth has no character. It's just hypocrisy. In the study of John, and in 1 John, we see humility. We, we see love. We see truth. We see a tenderness for the Lord as well as a love for the church and for, for God's people. And, and I want that. I, I need that. And it's what God is already working in me on. And I, I thank God for the, the freedom he gives, the forgiveness he gives. How, how about you? Perhaps God is convicting you on a specific sin or specific sins. Maybe there's some specific areas that God now, in the quiet, has been pointing out to you in the mirror of what we've seen this morning. Draw some comfort from this. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Every one of us is in need of the forgiveness of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It means you, you can't out, uh, out-sin God. You can't sin so greatly that his forgiveness... Is, is diminished and, and can't cover over your sin. We, we find that forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Something that we regularly need to do is turn to him and seek forgiveness. The Spirit of God will prompt and move. And we, instead of having clenched fists, we have open hands to say, God, have your, have your way. I, I want you to, I need you to forgive me of my sins, and, and I need, and I want to walk with you. I desire you. I desire your ways. If you've never trusted in Christ, may today be the day of salvation. John has written, so that you will know that you have eternal life. If you don't know that eternal life is available for you. Confess your sins to him and trust in him. For those that have been struggling in your sin, John says, My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We have Christ. Forgiveness is available to all. Starting fresh. Uh, that your joy may be complete. Do you need that today?